Maher, it's lovely to have you here. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm privileged to be with you. Oh, that's very kind. So listen, we, we've got a lot of formal questions, but I have to start with one uh, because it, we've, I've read out your introduction and it's incredible. I want to know a little bit about your opera singing before we go into the business stuff. Tell me a bit about that, your opera career and your musical career. Well, I, I do believe, Maria, that I'm, I was born to be on stage and I always wanted to, to sing and perform. And I did, I studied for more than 20 years opera singing. I had master classes in Italy. I studied here in Lebanon and I always wanted to sing. And then I've discovered a few years after that uh, I'm enjoying uh, public speaking on stage, even when I was at school and university. And then I say, wh why not mixing both public speaking and opera singing? That's wonderful. I love that. So let, let's talk a bit about innovation, because innovation is you live, you breathe it. It's part of your DNA. What is the problem that you solve as an innovation expert? Well, that's a great question, because nowadays corporations all over the world are facing a lot of challenges. I'm just going to talk now about two of them, which are employee engagement and growth. We, we can even see companies that have flat growth not to talk about companies that are shutting down or having a declining trend. So if you think about it, who's gonna drive the growth in the company? No magic, it's the employees. <laughs> How? By providing them with the right methodology, with the right mindset, with the right tools and techniques. So it's the employees that are gonna drive the growth. So if they're not engaged, and now a lot of studies shows that employees' engagement is not more than 13%. So 13% of your employees are engaged, not highly engaged. So you're paying money to around 90% of your employees with almost no return. They are doing their operational work. So forgive me for saying this, they are acting like robots. And if you're acting like a robot, so if, if you're just doing your operational work, your job title, you're not going the extra mile. So if you act like a robot, you'll be replaced one day by a robot. I mean, robot AI, machine learning, you know, all the future trends. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and tell me, what's the distinction between uh, an innovation expert, um, an inventor, a practitioner? Can you give me the distinctions, the definitions? Yeah, now, now the difference is that a practitioner is usually someone that has implemented innovation someone that has invented. I do believe that you cannot teach innovation. You can teach creativity, but you cannot teach innovation, which is the execution of your ideas. And that's the difference between creativity and, and, and innovation. You cannot teach people how to execute, launch their ideas successfully if you didn't do it, if you didn't fail, if you didn't learn how to do it the right way. So, so being a, an inventor is like being a practitioner, a hands-on, someone that did it, failed, learned how to do it the right way, and now can teach people how to do it with more success chances and less failure. Which is really important because I imagine it's a very expensive thing to do if you're failing, isn't it? Steve Jobs, you know, he was fired one of the times because he spent a lot of money on the research on a computer that he was, and, and then they said, we cannot wait more, we cannot give you more time and more budget, you're fired. So yeah, if it goes wrong, <laughs> you know. Yeah, wow, okay, let's hope that doesn't happen to us. So tell me, um, because you know, in terms of audience and in terms of clients, you could work with anybody really with regards to innovation. Do you work specifically with certain targets, certain markets, certain types of people? Yeah, of course, because when you claim that you are a practitioner, people will look at you and say, what are your success stories? What have you done? And in which industries? So mainly my focus is towards corporations and mainly banking industries, telecom industries, and pharmaceuticals. Which actually all require lots of innovation, don't they? Um, and yes. quite high speed innovation as well. We've seen the, the COVID. People used to, to think that you cannot come up with a vaccine if you don't have four to six years of testing. Now we see that in six months, 
four to six months, you can come up with a vaccine that is working out. And this is one of the theories that I used to teach people is that they used to say, when you want someone to come up with an idea and work on it, you need more time. I used to say, no, if you put him in, in a specific time, if you put him under pressure somehow, and you say you have two, three days, he will give you more creative ideas. So, you know, there are people who, who, say, who don't believe in that. I believe in that. And, and the coronavirus showed that what I, I have been saying is right. <laughs> And you know, and I, I think it's true. I think if you put it under pressure and you need to to make a decision fast and, and be creative, I think you're absolutely right. And often it's when we're facing a problem that we solve it as opposed to sort of, you know, being prepared for it. I, I agree with that. You've got your own model, um, your own methodology. Can you tell me a little bit about that, your change model? Yeah. So, so you know, by implementing innovation, by inventing several products, service, whether in the banking sector or else, I came up with a methodology, which is the become an innovator methodology. And that's the change model that I have. That's the difference between what people do and what we do. So, uh, so it's built on three pillars. I call it the simplified innovation, but it's the become an innovator uh, methodology. So uh, if you apply the innovator's mindset and, and we really help you discover what is the innovator's mindset, if you apply the innovators tool, the app that I have invented, and it's an engaging app built on sound, music, 3D images, and so on, and you live the habits, the four habits that I found by inventing, then you will become an innovator and you will have more chances of success. So that's our distinction and our change model where we come to corporations, we, we, we teach them teach them how to apply the become an innovator methodology. And then with time, they start innovating. They start growing their company, improving their daily work and finding solutions. Which are fantastic outcomes really, aren't they? I mean, that's great. That's what every organization wants, isn't it? Yes, of course, that, that's, that's an outcome and that's a major challenge. If you don't innovate, you evaporate. Nowadays, if you don't innovate, uh, it's not a question of making 10 or 20% you'll be out of the market, you'll be out of the industry. And we've seen a bunch of them, especially lately in the last two years, they couldn't make it. Yeah. So the competition is high, the stakes are high. You yeah. just can do what you've been doing for the last years. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. So you personally have invented um, two particular loans, which were mentioned in the introduction in retail banking. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Because I think it's an amazing story for people who, who may not have heard it. I can't imagine anybody hasn't, but, but share the story with us. Well, I used to work in uh, one of the banks in the region here. And one day I decided to do something different. I said, I don't want to be a number marketing manager just like the others. So I thought of the Lebanese war. I said, what could have affected the consumer behavior in Lebanon? I conducted a study on the consequence of the Lebanese war for 40 years on the consumer behavior. Are we consuming more or less? And I found that 18.7% of Lebanese couples cannot conceive without a medical assistant. So we've done the research. What are people doing now if they don't have the money to have their infertility treatments. And by, by doing the study, we decided to kick off, I decided to kick off the fertility loan. By kicking off the fertility loan, we became the talk of the world. I say we, the bank and myself, uh, we had 167 media stations like CNN, BBC, Reuters, you name them. Uh, they were all in my office asking me about how I came up with the idea, CNN said uh, Maher Mizhar and the bank changed the face of banking from house loan to, to car loan up to stem cells loan, uh, fertility loan, and so on. Uh, plus, I became a case study in Professor Scotler's uh, book. Uh, I was invited by Harvard to speak twice. So people were not expecting a bank because, you know, banks are conservative. That's what people say. So come up with something like a fertility loan, a stem cell loan, plastic surgery loan, you name them. Uh, and I think that that's what banks should be doing, thinking out of the box. And I think personally, 
that banks in the future will have a totally different uh, uh, look and feel, totally different strategies. And I think they'll be coming from different industries. And I think they have to because they're being challenged, aren't they? Banking is really being challenged. Oh, oh yes, indeed. Lately, they have been really challenged. Fantastic. So here's a question about your your speeches, because obviously, as an innovator, you 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 have and you know your opera singing. You say you bring singing into it. One of the things that's a real challenge for speakers is for their message to be memorable, for the audience to remember it and to apply it. And obviously, if they bring you in to to practice your methodology and to teach that, that's one thing. But if they're bringing you in for a speech, how do you make your speech memorable? What stories do you share? Uh, well, uh, that's that's the major distinction that I work a lot on it. I consider each speech or each workshop as a performance, even if the topic is the same. So uh, I search a lot and ask a lot about my audience to know who they are, what are their objectives, and what the, what, what is the outcome or the outcomes that they want from the speech or the workshop. So just to share with you, I was delivering a speech for a major telecom company, regional telecom company in the region. We had around maybe 2,000 something, 3,000 person attending. And the topic was innovation and the surprise factor. So how can you use the surprise factor to lead your industry? So when, when I finished explaining the effect of the surprise factor, I stopped for a while and I started singing Oswali New, loud. So, so people were like, for a second, what should we do? They were like, they stopped breathing. Should we give him a round of applause or tell him that it is crazy? And then when I finished, they realized that this is something creative. So they started giving me a, a round of applause. And when they stopped applauding, I said, guys, I was testing the surprise factor. And then they started applauding a second time and laughing. And you know, after that, I've received like feedback saying, we will never forget this speech because you taught us, you talked about the surprise factor and you walked the talk, you showed us that when you surprise uh, people, people will remember you, you will be on the top of the mound. Fantastic. And so what happens next then? So you'll, you'll go in, you'll, you'll share the surprise factor, you'll talk about the innovation methodology, methodology, I can't even say it today. When clients ask you back, what do you do with them? How do you work with them? How, what's the process? Is it, does it take a long time or can you help them implement quite quickly? Yeah, that's, that's, that's one of our major uh, distinction as well, is that uh, we implement innovation. So we do consulting and we do training. We help them build their innovation committee. We, they receive ideas from employees. We help them build their innovation funnel where employees can send ideas to the innovation company. We, after doing this, delivering the speech, we do a, dive, a deep dive where we do the workshops. Then we do one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and then we, we sit down with their top management to scratch their innovation strategy, what they want to do, what they want to achieve from innovation. So, so and then we work on having an incubator, a place where people can go to uh, during their working hours and come up with ideas and, and, and develop and execute their ideas. So usually it takes, two to three months where you can implement all that. And if the number of employees and departments is huge, then it would take six to nine months, which is excellent because we are talking about three, four, five, six months. You're not talking about three, four, five years. So in a year, by the end of the year, they can see ideas that they were accepted by the top management, by the innovation company. Some of them implemented and they can see results. So because we, we show return on innovation, and because we show return on investment, people, people call us back. So we, we have more than 90% of our customers, they ask us to come back. Like this telecom company I shared, we've been working for them for six, seven years. So most of our customers, unless they don't want innovation, so they have the speech, they have a workshop, say, no, that's not what we want. But this, what they want, most of our customers, they say, come back, we want more, we want more, we want more. And I love the fact that you talk about return on innovation and return on investment. I think going forward for any business bringing experts in to help, it's more and more important. You know, after what we've been through, I think people will be looking at that very, very closely. So I love the fact that you do that, that you measure it. Exactly. We, we, we have different, you know, metrics. 
We look at return on innovation, return on opportunities, return on investment. So we can really measure it and say, guys, you've spent 100K, that's the return. You've spent 500K, that's the return. And, and that has been always the problem in our industry where, you know, you have speakers, you have consultants, but then they say, we can't see, uh, we can't see the return. Sometimes the return is the, is the culture. You're working on the mindset. So you cannot measure it on short term. That's why we did put a system and we did put a, a we call it in consultancy, the innovation roadmap, the innovators roadmap, where we implement and show short term a return on innovation. Love that. Thank you very much. So we said in the introduction that obviously you're available to book via London Speaker Bureau. But if somebody wants to connect with you and have a discussion about innovation before they perhaps book you for, for some speaking, what's the best way to connect with you? Well, I would advise them to go to my website, Maher Mizher, M-A-H-E-R, M-E-Z-H-E-R, and pick what they want and then get in touch with London Speakers Bureau where they can book me or get in touch with me. And once we decide, we will put them in touch with London speakers. Lovely. That's wonderful. So listen, you know, there's so much expertise for, from you. What, what one thought would you like to leave the audience with, with regards to innovation? Maybe even more than one, if you like. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, I would like to, to say to corporations listening to us, innovate or evaporate. I would like to say to speakers bureau, listening to us, think like an artist, act like a leaders. And I would like to say to all of the speakers and people listening to us, remember innovation is like a knife. You put it in the hand of a surgeon, he would save lives. You put it in the hands of a criminal, you know what could happen. So when you decide to innovate, be, the surgeon. Wow, that's really profound. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Maher. It's a pleasure. Thank you for your time.